really thrilled today to be able to have this event to talk about MOOCs again. Uh, many of you may remember or even attended the event we had in February of last year where Amy Collier from Stanford came and did a fabulous presentation on how they're using MOOCs at, at Stanford. Uh, based on that, I changed my views on MOOCs a bit and when I had a student, a graduate student this semester who was not feeling real confident about her abilities in statistics and knew she would be taking this fall an advanced statistics class, um, I said, well, you know, why don't we see if we can find a MOOC for you? And we actually found two on general statistics with the kind of scientific emphasis that we, I was looking for, one out of San Jose State and the other from Stanford. And they were self-paced. They were just whenever she wanted to do them, and they were free. And she went online and did both of them and had really great comments about the strengths of each, but thoroughly appreciated doing both of them, completed them all, and actually she's doing quite well in her statistics class this semester and went in in a way I think that let her be better prepared than many of the other students who were in the same in the same uh, class both graduate students and undergraduates too so that really gave me confidence about the usefulness of MOOCs so I'm very excited and I'm sure you are too to hear from our two speakers today Bernie Dodge from it used to be Ed Tech. Ed Tech, and now it's Learning Design and Technology. And learning <coughs> Design and Technology. And um, so we'll hear from Bernie, and then we'll hear from Amy Schmitz Weiss, who's also going to talk to us about um, her adventures with MOOC um, from journalism and media studies. Okay, great. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll hand the stage over to our presenters. Thank you. This is uh, divided into two parts, and in the first part, I'll be talking about time and engagement. Um, and in fact, you know, when we had to come up with a name for this a couple months ago, time management was the closest we could come to it. But I'm, I'm beginning to think time is one of those things you can't really manage. You can manage the stuff within time, but, but we all live within this box of 24 hours a day. Our students live within a box that has other kinds of demands on their time. And uh, one of the things I want to talk about is how we can make the best use of the time we have. We can't really manage it, but we can manage what we do within it. So in these two parts, um, I'm going to talk about those two things. And I want to talk very briefly about a, w a way, a lens to look at your own courses through. Because I think one of the things that is a problem when we talk about improving our courses or comparing one course with another or comparing a MOOC with a blended, with a flipped, with a this and a that, is that we don't have a very precise way to think about them and to talk about them. So I want to go through that. Amy is then going to go, and I'm going to start about MOOCs and then move on to more general things. Amy is going to talk about uh, a fabulous MOOC that she uh, has just completed uh, doing, and, uh, and then more generally about how to take the lessons learned from that and bring them into our own courses. Could you turn out the lights? Yeah, I think I can. Oh yeah, much more romantic. Thank you for. Uh, coming <laughs> that was my. <laughs> okay. So time, I want to start by asking you to do something, uh, even if you're still eating. I want you to think about a class session you gave within the last week, a particular course, a particular class session. Think about some some something that you've done sometime in the last seven days, and here's my question for you. What have your students been doing since then? Not everything, but what, what have they been doing related to that course? And how long did they spend on it? Think about that for 30 seconds or so. And then I'm going to ask you to share with somebody within earshot of you. OK, share your perplexity with somebody nearby. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Who'd like to be the first to share uh, what your students have been up to and how long they were at it? Who'd like to be the second? <laughs> yes. Go. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, you. Um, <laughs> okay. So what what I do is I um, I give a lecture, but I'm not going into all the details. Yeah. And then I assign a reading of that lecture. Okay. And then when they come back the next time, I give them a very short multiple choice quiz, like five minutes. 
and it's just you know to check if they did the reading or not. So it's the in between and part. When, when you lost part, control I of them, think one and a half hours or one and a half hours of reading, reading. Yeah. just by themselves. Yeah. Do you think they form study groups? Not for the reading. No. Okay. Not for the reading. Because so an hour and a half of reading all by themselves yeah. uh, after your last class. And do you think they all did about that? Yeah. Is there a range? Um. Yeah, one, one guy yesterday admitted that he didn't read the reading because he didn't uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Who else has a, so there's an hour and a half for one course. Um, these are undergrads? No, grads. Grads, okay. Who else? You made eye contact. Sorry, what, what, what's your course? <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't have a course. You don't have a course, all right. Who's got a course? Yes, please. I have a, it's a 112 large lecture class, and they have a part four of their group project due next week. So I know that they spent time right after class and probably are going to spend at least, at least an hour, I hope more than that, but at least an hour dialoguing with their group to turn in part four next week. So an hour with the group, any other solo time with them thinking about what they're going to do with their group? Well, I ju just got an email, someone wants the study guide for the exam in December, so somebody's thinking about that. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Cool. Yeah. So my students in a 260-person class had a, their exam on Monday, so I'll talk about what I think they did the week before in preparing. So they had a homework assignment online, and the, we meet face to place. This is on Blackboard. They had a homework assignment online, and they had a series of practice sets and learning outcomes, and then the Camtasia videos of the preceding classes. And so I can go on. I could go on and see who had had who had never gone on and looked at videos before, and who did it last week, and who had never gone on and done the practice sets, and and how long they spent doing that online on Blackboard, and how they did on those. And I could also see how they did on their homeworks and how long it took them to do that and guess whether or not they, their time, they have a maximum amount of time they could spend, but I can see who spent the, all the time maybe looking through the book and who didn't. So on average, how many, uh, how many hours do you think they spent? And for last week, they, uh, if I added them all up on average, lots of variants there, yeah. they might have been still less than the two hours that I could measure. So I don't know what other time. But on those activities that I, the Blackboard measured for me, probably about 50 or 60 minutes total. Okay. So there's a range, but it sounds like they're all sort of clustering around one to two hours for a single class for, uh, for uh, across at least these three, the, these three samples. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is we really don't know. We know what happens for the 45 minutes or two hours and 40 minutes that we have them right in front of us. But as we move more and more towards blended classes, it goes into the great unknown. We don't, we don't really know. Um, and so for example, this is last week, or a week and a half ago in my class, I teach a teacher graduate class on, on educational game design. And I assigned these things to look at. They're all fairly short. Um, uh, they had an opportunity to look at the archive, of the, the, listen to the archive of the recording the week before. I gave them a choice of projects to work on, and so they work in teams. They had to spend some time figuring out which one of those they wanted to work on. And they also had two chapters to read out of a book and some sort of technical documentation there. So as I look at that, I would guess this would take them about, I don't know, an hour and a half of reading and uh, at least an hour of group time interacting with other people, but I just don't know. It's, it's not in Blackboard, it's in that great blank spot on the map of what happens to people once they step away from the keyboard and they're actually being human and thinking about the course and, and talking about it. So that's the part I'm, I'm, I'm interested in. That's the part where I think if we knew more about it, we could do a better job of improving our courses and understanding our courses and comparing one thing to another. MOOCs. I'm just back from sabbatical. You can tell how rested I am. Uh, <laughs> that lasted about a weekend. Uh, but from spring through the end of summer, I was uh, 3,000 miles away from committee meetings uh, so that I could just sort of focus on whatever I wanted. So I took that leisure time, leisure time, to take, I signed up for like five MOOCs. And the, the one I stuck with the longest is this one. It's a, a Coursera. <clears throat> and it's, uh, uh, it's about startup engineering. and. This, was, this is a screenshot of one of it. It was, it was a pretty good course, but um, this is what a lot of it looked like. Slides and a little talking head in the lower right corner there, talking about stuff. Uh, 
interesting stuff, lots of, lots of things to read. But as, as interested as I was in the content, and as free as my schedule was, not having to teach or do anything really, I managed to not finish this class. And it's because I didn't get fully engaged. And that's, that's kind of an interesting problem. And, and as I sat through that, uh, I began to realize this is what my own students feel like when they're not fully prepared for the thing that I'm dishing out. Because this is really aimed at 20-year-olds who go to Stanford, which I'm not. And, and I'm self-taught in computer science. So there's I big holes in my knowledge. I was ill-prepared for this. But I still enjoyed it, but not enough to stay with it. So that's kind of an interesting issue. As I look at a typical week in that class, <coughs> about two hours going through those slides and talking heads, uh, three hours of reading or so, and five hours of you know, slogging with code and looking up stuff and learning how to do stuff on the computer. That's a pretty substantial uh, load of stuff. That was a pretty demanding uh, class. So I know that about my performance my behavior in this class, but I don't know about the, the behavior of my own students. Now, if you think about taking your lectures, capturing them, bottling them, and inflicting them on your students at a distance, uh, here's, a, here's a, some very recent research that might give you pause. Uh, this is from uh, edX, the, uh, the, uh, the other, the, the Hertz to uh, Coursera's uh, Avis of, of uh, MOOCs. And it's, it's kind of a, a difficult graph to understand. This is the uh, medi median time that students watch a video, an ed uh, a video related to the class. This is the actual length of the video. Notice where the peak is. At six minutes, everybody watches up, up to that long, no matter what. The two, the two graphs are people who are getting some kind of certificate and, and then the other looky-loos that you know, populate MOOCs. If it was longer than, if the video was longer than six minutes, people actually watch less of it. So the, 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 the optimal length for a video in one of these situations is six minutes. So if you've captured your lecture and it's an hour long, good luck. <laughs> you should put something salacious in the last 10 minutes or so just to make sure people uh, actually watch it. Yeah. Yeah, I admit my ignorance. Would you mind telling me what MOOC is? Uh, you're going to get a snoot full of that from uh, Amy in the second half. But basically, a MOOC is a massively massive online open, open, open course. course. Yes, it's it's a, these courses like the one that I I was in had a hundred thousand people in it, and it was free. And so uh, it's this phenomenon. And and Amy will tell you firsthand her experience at uh, at uh, designing and, and running one. So all of this is about engagement. I fell out of that class because I was not fully engaged. And so uh, let me throw a question back out to you. We talk about learner engagement. I know there have been several of these luncheons about engagement. So what is it? Commitment. Commitment. OK, yep. I feel like it's a feedback. If you're in a class and you speak into the class and you feel like they're looking at you and you see the understanding, or at least see some kind of feedback, that's what I see, engagement. If you see they're looking at the phone, <coughs> this is a bad sign. Well, they're engaged in something, but it just isn't you. Okay. Yeah. That's true. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think it's about motivation. Mm. OK, motivation and attention. And what were you going to add? Yeah, I'm just wondering, because I just opened a course like that because it was about the science of food and example teaching. It. I never registered for the course or went there. Yeah. You didn't take that course. Right. I just kind of thought, hey, this is fun. Yeah. And so, so, so this data that you get from there, like the six-minute attention span, wouldn't it be different from my? It would be very different. Yeah, you could see the difference just in the people who were actually getting some kind of certificate from it. They stuck with it longer. The people who were like, like you, just dipping in, they, you know, after six minutes, they fell off. So probably it's longer than six minutes for a required video that's part of your required class. There's no question. But I don't think it's that far off. I think, I think you know, shorter is better. And Amy's going to make that same point uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so engagement has so many meanings. I, I've seen places, there's a center for study of engagement or something in schools. And they measure it by seats in, in chairs in schools or participation in after school activities. I mean, it's, it's a whole range of things. I'm almost ready to banish that word, at least in my own use of it, because it means so many things, it almost means nothing. Well, let's talk about a way to think about engagement in our own classes that might help us uh, 
get better about uh, doing it. And, and uh, I, I call it, just to help you remember it, I call it the pig's model. If you've ever stood in front of a well-prepared lecture, a lecture you really loved giving, and you put it out there and people just don't seem interested, you know, there's, there's a quote from either Shakespeare or the Bible or the Beatles about casting pearls before swine. That might help you remember that uh, the, the, the pig's model, which is just kind of a, sh a shorthand way for us to think about the classes we teach, whether they're MOOCs or seminars. Uh, they can all be thought about in this way. And basically, it looks like this. It's all about interactions. So at the center of the interactions, not us, it's students. And you know we'll call them students for S, and they could be learner, trainee, participant. Uh, at the other end, us, there's a guide of some kind, teacher, faculty, instructor. Um, there is also information. And the internet has made, you know, we're, we're overflowing in that right now, and, that, and that's, that's a benefit, and then peers. So if you look at the whole picture, these are the ingredients, the interactions among these four players. Uh, oh, the student themselves is, is, uh, is really what we're talking about here. My assumption, based on teaching for a long time now, is that learning requires interaction with something, not your phone, not Facebook, but something that's relevant to the, to the course contact. And that the more interaction there is, and that the higher level of thinking that's involved in that interaction, the more likely learning and enjoyment, I think, is to take place. I'm going to switch to this. So let's call that system of engagement, of, of interactions, engagement. And let's say that engagement, it's, it's a function of the number of interactions, the level of thinking involved, and how long they are. Something quick and short is not as, as engaging as, as, as potentially as something that's longer. So those interactions, you know, here's a traditional class. Teacher and student interacting. Teacher uh, lectures, students ask and answer questions. Um, the, the homework, typically in a, a traditional class, is student interacts with some form of data on the screen, on a book, out in the wild, whatever it is. Uh, students working together on projects is the, the third kind of interaction with peers, study groups, discussion forums, and so on. And finally, uh, and this is illegal in several southern states, interacting with yourself, um, <laughs> looking inward, <laughs> tapping your prior knowledge, memories, reflecting on newly learned knowledge, mulling, you know, mulling how you think about things. So all of these interactions together constitute what I would call engagement. Traditional lecture is just that. It's, it's kind of spartan. It's kind of sparse. It's kind of not so interesting. Um, going to the library, a student having been given some kind of assignment, reflecting on it and, and looking things up, that, that combination is richer than some things. Uh, working on a group project, you got interactions in all three directions. And, and again, based on my assumption of the number of interactions and the kinds of interactions, this is potentially a much richer environment than a traditional standard deliver lecture. So we could boil it down into a periodic table of learner interactions in which we have the kinds of things, the kinds of interactions we're looking at, and down here, the heavier elements are the kinds of things where there's higher level thinking involved. And so any course we have can be seen as a combination of these kinds of chemicals, these kinds of interactions, uh, all spaced over time. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. What does assessment fit in to all of this? Assessment is the end result of all of this. What I'm trying to do is figure out what is the environment that, that's making a change in people that we can then later assess. You know, we can assess the quality of a course by sort of counting these things, perhaps. But you're, you're talking about learner outcomes? You're talking about more formative assessment than some of the assessment. It's going to be ongoing. As, as they're going through the course, how are they assessing their learning? That's orthogonal to what I'm talking about. Okay. Back to my course here. Uh, again, as I look at this, I can see there were times there that were, where students are working alone, uh, reading these things. There are times when they're interacting with others. I'm in there and interacting with them occasionally. Uh, and so that combination of things is, is, uh, is what I'm striving for here. But I don't know how much time they're spending. I don't know how much time and how well they're spending uh, in this environment that I created in this course. Uh, this is what I guess it is, though. I teach my class on Mondays. And so uh, I don't lecture for very long. So for maybe half an hour or so, I'm up there presenting some new stuff and, and interacting with them. But then they spend more of their time with their peers, and they spend time reading stuff that, that I've assigned. 
And that's, that, I see that happening in front of me. We meet together for two hours and a half or so uh, in the room. But then after that, generally on Wednesdays, they'll be meeting with their, their, their peers, and they'll be reading some more stuff. And then on the weekends, typically, it seems to me, they get to work alone and figure out uh, what, the, what they're doing. So in this case, they are working on a design plan, and they're, having, they're combining what they learned in their groups, and for me, with their own thoughts uh, on the weekends. That may be what's happening, but I just don't know. There's this new thing out. It's gotten some buzz. I don't know if this has been talked about at one of these lunches. But it's called the Experience API, or the Tin Can API. And it addresses the fact that we're going bonkers right now with learner analytics, tracking every little twitch of their mouse uh, as they go through Blackboard. But the real action happens away from Blackboard often. And the Tin Can API is an attempt to, to capture that to find a way to, to, to grab it and bring it into the mix so that as we analyze what our learning environments are like, we'll have a, a better handle on it. So this is a project that I've just started. And, uh, I don't have results to show, show uh, yet. But I've started giving my students time cards to fill out. So at the end of uh, each, each class, they get a fresh time card. This is going to be an online thing. And basically, the way the Tin Can API works is that it's a subject, verb, object. I read chapter 11, and for how long? 30 minutes. I brainstormed with my teammates for 60 minutes, and so on. So every week, my students, I started one class, I'm starting the other one next week, are completing these time cards so that I'll have a better handle on what's going on. And once I have that knowledge, I'll be able to see if I'm assigning too much reading, or if the projects are too hard, or if they're just tuning out, or if the groups aren't really adding much to the mix. Uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing what I, what I learned from this. And I'm also, because it's going to be an online form, I would love it if any of the rest of you would like to, to work with this as well, as, assign the same, same uh, data collection to your own classes. Because I'd love to have some comparisons between a grad class and an undergrad class, a class that's totally in the room versus distance and so on. Bernie, how confident do you feel that they're going to be up front with you about this? You know, I, I know grad, grad students are different from undergrads. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of trust. I'm going to, they will, they'll identify themselves here with a red ID, which, you know, I haven't memorized. So I, and I, and I will, I have told them that this plays no part in your grade at all. This is just me doing some personal science on, on, on my own teaching. Uh, so, you know, as long as, I can make that clear and, and they believe it. I know my students will, for the most part. Mm -hmm. uh, undergrads, I'm not sure. Maybe tougher. Uh, maybe tougher. But I, I would, you know, if, if you could guarantee their anonymity by having them use some other way to identify themselves, uh, that would be good. I wonder if you're asking for this data in conjunction with everything else, providing a context of what they are doing. Like, it could be that the answers will vary according to how many classes they are taking. Yeah. What other outside activities or work. The, 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 the comment is uh, whether, you know, the, the, my class is just a small part of everyone's life. Right. And, right. and so to really understand this, I would need to know what else. So, right. you know, again, in my small graduate program, I know what other classes they're taking, but, mm -hmm. but they may be going through some personal crisis. There may be lots going on in their family. It could be other things impinging on it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think I, what I'm interested in is looking, is somewhat, summing across all of those things and just try to see what, what patterns there are. But that's an important thing to really, to really understand it. I have to know more mm -hmm. about them. Then we get into IRB issues, I guess. So the questions I have are, you know, how long do, if I give a bunch of readings, mm -hmm. if I give more readings, my syllabus looks more rigorous and I look great to my colleagues. But uh, do they really do them? Uh, I, sometimes I suspect they don't. Sometimes I think it's, it's sort of like the, in the Soviet Union, they used to say, you know, they pay you in rubles that you couldn't spend anywhere else. So the, the, the saying was, uh, uh, you pretend to pay me and I'll pretend to work. Uh, so. <laughs> Assigning long lists of readings is, is uh, perhaps uh, some of that same kind of self-deception. Uh, do they tune out of videos if, if I assign them? Uh, how long do they spend? How much are group projects really worth it? Is there enough uh, bang for the buck in terms of the overhead of coordinating with everybody and, and dealing with other people? And then the notion, I think, of short tasks uh, interspersed with things to do, short videos, short information coming in, interspersed with something uh, to, to do with the information. That I think is I, I, probably more successful than long inputs separated by a long interval before you actually do something with it. So these are the kinds of questions that I'm going to be grappling with for my own classes. And again, 
if, if any of you are interested in participating in this with, with your classes, I'd, I'd love to, to, uh, to work with you on that. And that concludes part one. Yeah, we'll, we'll have questions. Thank you. We'll have questions at the end, but I will take one now. I to make a comment about the last slide that you had about the readings. Um, I'm a new professor here, and so I had assigned a lot of readings, like, you know, Monday and Wednesday, you know, two, three readings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was not just time consuming for my students, but it was for myself. And right. And I found that these 50 minute courses, I couldn't even get through one reading, you know. Right. So I'm like, you know, let's just do one reading in detail, you know, per class. And I found that to be more, more effective because I know, like you were saying, they're not reading the no. second one or the third one. It's a game so we all just, play. You know, kind of finding the balance. And I think I did. Yeah. Thank God I'm tenured. Yeah. <laughs> just about the, the whole concept. So, because maybe following up on what you were saying, so what I feel is kind of you're measuring your course, or your success in the course, at least at this point, on how much time do the students spend on different um, activities. And I'm used to completely the difference, we kind of, when I was doing my coursework, I had one final exam, and I was only measured on if I could solve the problems on that final exam. Yeah. So it seems to be a complete different approach. Well, again, the grad students, my, my courses are all project-based. I haven't given a final exam or a midterm in 25 years. So, you know, my assessments are ongoing. I, I see I'm working with them while they're completing their projects, and then, then we grade the project. I give them a second chance to make it better. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different paradigm. So, yeah, your mileage will vary, I'm, I'm sure. But, but, but again, it, this is really about... Not, not so much assessing how well they do, although I'd love it to, to, to see some kind of correlation between the way they spend their time and, and, uh, and improvements in, in how much they learn. But I'm also looking for improvements in their motivation to continue learning about this topic and their enjoyment of the class and, and all those things that are part of the larger picture. Last I question. I have a quick question. Since I'm a physicist, I want to kind of have a quantitative description. Yeah. If we measure, say, well, there's certain material to cover in a class. And let's say you, you cover like, certain chapters in the book and you s uh, cover in a certain deepness and you know that your students learn well within the material, the material you gave them. Yeah. So in your research, what you find is the optimal ratio between, enga be between this, all these parts of the engagement, <coughs> meaning engagement with the professor, engagement with peers, and engagement with like data, like independent reading or assignments. What is it or if any perfect ratio between these three parts of the engagement? Uh, well, first of all, ask me again in two years. Then I'll have some data to, to share with you. But, but secondly, I think this is all idiosyncratic. That's why I mentioned being a personal scientist on my own teaching. I think everybody's, everybody's situation is different. My learners, are, my, my students are different than, from yours. My content is different from yours. And I think the mix of what's going to work well for us is, is going gonna, is gonna to vary on, depending on a lot of stuff. So I'm going to just try to make myself smarter about making that mix uh, and, and, and encouraging the rest of you to do that same kind of introspection and figure out what works for you. I don't think the general rules about these things are going to be so vague that, as to be not oper operationable, op operationalizable. But in your project-oriented classes, like 30, 30, 30, or whatever, 33, 33, like equal? distribution or probably more it, it, it varies on the project and it, it varies on what level course we're in so I, I can't even generalize that but I mean I'd like like all of us I'm, I'm sort of operating by the seat of my pants by my hunches by what went well last semester mm -hmm. but I think you know, what I'm what I'm encouraging myself to do at least is to get clearer about exactly what's going on so that I can have a, a deeper understanding of how things work the way they did I, I want to give Amy time to talk and so it's, it's now your turn Okay, hi everybody. Uh, so, tying back into Bernie's discussion about looking at how we can manage our time as educators with the classes that we teach, um, I wanted to talk with you about today specifically looking at not just MOOCs, the massive open online courses, but looking at how these principles can also apply within large lecture settings too. Um, in particular, many of us know that we've got the challenges of time. <laughs> Having the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one interaction with our students when it's a large class, again, whether it's face-to-face -face or even online or in a MOOC setting, and also the ability for the students to feel like they have a quality experience. But I think there are opportunities for us to have different approaches and ways of 
helping our students gain that learning that we want them to have, even within this different kind of modality. And it entails uh, three things that I wanted to talk with you about today that I think are aspects of keys to success to help with large lecture classes, as well as online classes and MOOCs in that regard. And, and one of them is organization. The other one is interaction and communication, tying back into the engagement aspect that Bernie was just men mentioning. And then also low stakes exercises. So the information I'm sharing with you today is based off of an experience that I've had just recently. And I wanted to share with you some of the things that I learned from that process. But I had an opportunity to teach a MOOC this summer with the Knight Center for Journalism in the Americas. And it was a course focused on teaching folks all around the world about data-driven journalism techniques. So people who ended up taking the class were students, average citizens, statisticians, PR practitioners, journalists, <laughs> scientists. <laughs> so it was a wide group, very diverse. Um, and there was over 3,700 people in the course from over 140 countries, basically. And with the course, I actually uh, created the course, coordinated it, managed it, and then taught one of the weeks. And then I had four other instructors from different news organizations teach each of the other weeks. Um, as the overall coordinator, I was constantly keeping tabs on how everything was going in the course. But the tips I'm going to give you today are based on those experiences that I've had with teaching that MOOC uh, just this summer. So first of all, when we think about organization, it can't be said enough that planning is key. Um, and of course, with time management, <laughs> The more you can plan, the more you can be organized, the better off you'll be in terms of helping the students get through that learning experience with you. Again, whether it's face-to-face -face in a large lecture class or if it's online. And in that regard, I think it starts back to the basics of the actual syllabus. If you can be as detailed as possible, it sounds very common sense, <laughs> very silly in terms of thinking about that, but the syllabus is really your contract with the students, and it's that guide that helps them along in that learning experience. So the details are not just this is what reading you have for this week or this is uh, what video you need to watch, but going through the actual details of this is what it means to be in this class, this is how we're going to interact with each other on a daily or weekly basis, this is what you need to be reading between Sunday and Tuesday. This is what you need to be doing between Wednesday and Saturday, ideally. So being as detailed as possible, providing how-tos in the syllabus. Uh, a lot of the syllabus um, work that I have in the syllabi that I've done have been over 15 pages, <laughs> quite a lot. But it gives the students a lot of information that they can go back to over and over again. Also, I think setting a communication policy is key in this day and age, being able to manage our own time and when we want to speak <laughs> with the students, how we want to respond to them in emails and so forth is really important. I think setting up that communication policy right from the beginning that you'll get back to them within 48 hours or 24 hours or however you set that up and what mode uh, you'll be communicating with them. If it's going to be email, if it's going to be face to face, perhaps through Google Hangouts or even a variety of, of different options in terms of communication. And then also, I recommend doing a course FAQ, which is a place where they can go and all the same questions that all 200 ask <laughs> over and over again, putting it into an FAQ so that they can easily go to that FAQ and reference the information. Saves you a lot of time from having to go back and answer that question again via <laughs> email or even face to face. Having a question for the instructor's forum is also another tip. Uh, so again, oftentimes the students have very similar questions to each other. Uh, in terms of assignments or whatever kind of work they might be working on for that week. And so having an actual forum where everybody can see those questions all together and then for the instructor to decide when they want to go in and respond back so that the students can see those responses is a great technique. It worked out very well. Um, I've used it in the past um, and worked well in the, in the MOOC. And then, of course, setting clear expectations. Again, making sure that you tell the students exactly what you want them to do at different points in time throughout the course. Now, the other parts of this, too, and it ties into what Bernie was talking about, is communication um, and interaction. And I think the more opportunities you can provide <laughs> students in large lecture classes, whether, again, they're online or they're a MOOC, is having that opportunity to allow for them to have diverse methods by which to communicate with each other, but also with you. And so having frequent and diverse methods to communicate with the students can be effective, can help them feel that you are there with them on this journey and that you're constantly 
helping them along. Um, and so one of the things that I've done in the past has been helpful with the MOOC was sending out messages. It was three times a week. It was a little bit of time to put that message together, but it helped to alleviate a lot of questions and it helped to scaffold their learning throughout the week by sending out a, a welcome message at the beginning of the week that kind of covered the basis of this is what's going to happen this week and these are the things to look out for, the things to pay attention to. If you've got questions along the way, here you there's, go to this particular part of the course or this part. And then sending a midweek message telling people, okay, these are the observations I've been noticing of what people are discussing in the forums and in the chat room. Uh, and this, these are the aspects of the assignments that you need to pay attention to for the rest of the week. And then a wrap-up message at the end that concludes all of the finer points of what's happened in that week, bringing in some of the students' um, points and comments into the message, and then sending that out. And in some cases, you can do this with a variety of different tools nowadays. If, it takes a lot of time to do a text tool, you know, typing out your, your message. You can do it via audio and just send, send a, an audio file out to the students or doing it via video as well, depending on your, your comfortability. Now, the other one is also looking at how much you can look at how the forums can help make these smaller digital communities within the actual course and having them set up by which the students have the opportunity to jump into different topics. So instead of forcing all the students to just go into one discussion forum on one topic for that week, give them the opportunity and a chance to make a choice that you have perhaps four or five discussion topics that they can jump into. And within each of those, having smaller forums that they can feel that they're connected to. Ideally, what I had noticed from the MOOC and teaching it this summer was there was about 20 to 25 people per these digital communities in these forums that it ended up working out really well. They felt connected to each other and they didn't feel overwhelmed by seeing too many people in the forum and trying to keep up with the messages that were going through. Also, allowing for some of the individuals in the course to become leaders of discussions. So giving them the opportunity to actually take on that role and guide the discussion. And of course, that comes from time of looking at exactly who's more interactive in the course, <laughs> who's participating a lot, speaking out a lot, and then giving them some uh, guidelines and a rubric by which they can understand how they should be guiding that discussion for the week. And then, of course, another aspect to this is looking at how to participate in the forums with observation posts. I think as uh, educators, we feel that we constantly need to be responding to every post that comes through in a forum. But I don't think you need to have to go that direction. If you take the time to actually go through and decide to respond to a few, and then go in and start to look at the overall general theme of what's happening in that particular forum or set of forums, making observations, taking in some of the excerpts that they've said, and then copying and pasting that into an observation post and saying, OK, I see several of you have said this about that. Let, and this is your particular point. This is your analysis of how you see this happening. Think it is much more effective use of your time. But it also allows for the students to know that the discussion forum is not just instructor student, but it's a community. And for them to feel that you're a part of it, but you're not leading it. It's tied to that overall aspect that was getting back to what Bernie was saying, of really helping the students feel that they're a part of a bigger digital community versus just instructor to student. And then also looking at doing some synchronous sessions. So not everything should be asynchronous. And of course, again, all depends on the time that we all have in a week. <laughs> but taking out even just one hour a week can be helpful um, for the students. And doing, for instance, a Google Hangout, where you sit in front of your your laptop computer, and you have a virtual office hour for that hour for the students to come in, ask questions uh, that they may have, trying to get solidification on a specific concept or term that they didn't understand. And then <clears throat> the great thing about that <clears throat> is that you can actually tape it. So if students aren't able to attend that virtual office hour through Google Hangout, you can post the video up later for them to go back and look at. So it's another way, for, again, for them to have a chance to get additional information, to clarify any confusion that they may be having during that week. And then, of course, another aspect of looking at the diversity of these different kinds of communication channels is also looking at social media. So thinking about creating a Facebook page devoted to that particular course for the semester, or creating a Twitter hashtag devoted to that course for the semester, 
or to that particular topic. For the MOOC that I taught, I created a, a Facebook page that has over, last I checked yesterday, I think it was over 1,800 people on it from the class. And then we had a Twitter hashtag as well. And it gave the students in the class another opportunity to communicate with each other. Some of them felt more comfortable in these particular platforms speaking with each other than they did in the discussion forums in the MOOC. So again, providing them the opportunity to have diverse platforms by which to communicate with each other and the instructor, I think can help in that regard. And they would bring up different resources and articles on the Facebook page and in the Twitter uh, channel that I actually would go back and start inserting into the course during the, the five weeks that we were together and say, oh, well, so-and-so student brought this up. I think it's a great point that none of us had maybe come across before. So it really helps to encourage that level of interaction in a different way. And then lastly, also bringing up low stakes exercises. So again, when you're dealing with a large lecture class, again, whether it's face to face or online or even a MOOC, um, providing the opportunity to spread out the exercises throughout the semester versus having a big project due at the end of the semester <laughs> where all the pressure and the stress is on them, plus also all of us, <laughs> to grade all of those at the end of the semester, having it spread out through the whole semester and having low stakes exercises that can be done. So one of those is creating actually very short quizzes, five questions um, or 10 questions. Um, in the MOOC that I did, in the summer, we had 10 questions each week, and the majority of the people in the course completed them all the way up to the end. And they were able to, most of them ended up getting 80% or higher. Because the questions were not too difficult for them to grasp <laughs> and to understand and to be able to go back to the materials in order to take the quiz. Um, and so they did really successfully on it. Um, crowdsourcing class content is another aspect to this, too. Don't feel that you have to have the pressure to provide all the materials allow for them to have the opportunity to be a part of that conversation and to present some aspects of that class material during those weeks that you're together and tie that into a, a specific exercise. Also, thinking about weekly collaborative note-taking outlines that, again, can be formulated within the digital community, so small forums that you, fo that you have, or even having a critique or a response to a particular exemplar or case study that you can incorporate each week in the class that helps to build their critical thinking, the concepts that you want them to learn over the course of the whole semester that allows them to provide that final analysis or piece that you want them to produce. And then also looking at the aspect of having, again, interval assignments. So instead of just having them turn in a final project at the end, allow for them to build it over the weeks during that particular course that you have. I wanted to provide you with some additional tips. Um, and these are just different articles as well as videos um, that give additional strategies and, and tips on ways to think about teaching and managing <laughs> your time with teaching large classes or MOOCs, um, whether face-to-face -face or online. And I'll leave it open for questions. So I, I'll, I'll open it by, by first saying this sounds amazing. This is really cool. One of the questions I have, and this is for James and ITS as well as you, and that's how you decided to go with Hangout versus Blackboard Collaborate, because I've been having hassles with Collaborate, and so I was wondering about alternatives. But I just wondered what, what the pros and cons from the university perspective are and from the instructor's perspective. Yeah, I think it's uh, completely up to the faculty member to choose the tool that's right for them and their students. Um, collaborate, you know, is just into its very first semester here at San Diego State. There have been some speed bumps, so I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, we believe that those are starting to smooth out. Um, that is going to be, I think, in some ways easier for you than something like a Google Hangout. Mm -hmm. For those of us, I just actually met with some Meditech 795 students before coming to this via Google Hangout, <laughs> and I can't get into a Google Hangout with my SDSU email account. Right. I have to go mm -hmm. through my personal yeah. Gmail mm -hmm. account to get into the Google Hangout. Yeah. Anybody who's been through that song and dance yeah. knows what I'm talking about. So there's just maybe a little bit lower barrier to entry with something like Collaborate. 
but really, uh, you don't want to be overly prescriptive with this stuff. It really needs to be what's going to work for you and your students. But that entrance point is something I didn't know about, so that's good to know. And how did you get around? These weren't just SDSU students. They were all over the world. Right. right? They were all over the world. So it was a custom platform that was built out that we were accessing. And so basically we used a variety of different tools um, for those five weeks that we had the students for. I want to know, and I, I realize that maybe you don't have a specific answer, but in terms of your time into putting for students' feedback, for planning, um, how would you compare a traditional course to this experience? And understanding it benefited a lot more students, mm -hmm. but I want to see from your standpoint, you see yourself um, really needing to answer to every post and trying to, like, did you put a lot more time than than you would normally put mm -hmm. for a lecture mm -hmm. type of class or face-to-face? -face. It's a good question because when we look at the traditional classroom and then we look at teaching in the online realm, there is a big difference when you take it semester to semester and looking mm -hmm. at that um, and the amount of time that's spent. You will spend a lot more time building out your online course. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, it may be two to three times as much. Um, but I, I'm, I'm of the, the mindset that a lot of that time is in the beginning, in the planning stages, in the organization. So you'll be spending a lot more time at that stage mm -hmm. to get the foundation set to be perfect as much as possible so that it can be smoother sailing during the rest of the semester. And of course, the aspect that is a challenge with the online aspect of it for versus the traditional is the constant communication right. that you need to have with the right. students. But again, if you set up a clear communication policy and letting the students know that you're not going to be responding to them at 2 a.m., that the response time may be 24 or 48 hours, I think by also doing the frequent activities of communication with the, the multiple messages throughout the week, the observations in the forums, um, being present in Facebook and Twitter throughout the week, those different touch points will let them feel that you are there along with them, even if you may not be responding to them every single hour of every day. Mm -hmm. So I think that aspect of it does include some extra time mm -hmm. on the part of the instructor for the communication part of it. For this, it's, it's a little bit hard to compare the planning and organization that I did for this to a semester-long course, because mm -hmm. this was five weeks right. Right. versus a typical semester right. course, which would be 15, 14 right. to 15 weeks. So it was much shorter. But I spent a lot of time <laughs> putting it together. Um, for, the, for just doing these five weeks, it took me two and a half months to put together the plan and coordinate everything and communicate with the other instructors and then have a schedule on my end to organize and manage the whole course through the rest of it and then wrapping it up at the end when it was over. Right. So I guess my fear comes from like numbers, if, it's, if it grows exponential or not, because when I listen to what you're doing, I find myself doing all of that with the Blackboard platform, and, but I meet my students every week. So I do have those midweeks and wrapping up, and, but it's a number that's contained, mm -hmm. and I'm not going to be on Twitter or Facebook. Like, like in, any, in other words, we see each other on office hours, we see each other on, on messages, but there's no, no expectation of we are going, the scaffolding and everything gets done in that sense. So mm -hmm. how much more do you have to put in order to move into that? It's like, like, like it depends on the group? It the depends, yeah, have. exactly. It, it depends. There's, I, I don't think there's one straight answer to right. it. I know that does, that's, right. no, 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 but it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great answer, but it just depends on the right. topic right. And, and the actual. Can I just question. jump in real quick? Because I know some people are having to leave when we're going to just kind of continue because there's some great Q&A going on here. Um, please remember to fill out your feedback form and you can just leave it on your table if you have to go. So I'm under the impression that this class that you taught was not like part of the SDSU offering, but you did it for some outside organization. Yes, that's correct. And my my question, and I think there's there's really great tips for when you teach here, like online classes and so on. But my question is, you know, why is this centered on on MOOCs? Why would 
San Diego State wants to teach a, a, a MOOCs class because we already kind of over our head in teaching <laughs> students that enroll them that are paying. I mean, that's just maybe also for the organization or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> I just wanted to read that up. If, if I can, I, I think MOOCs are an extreme case of everything. It's an edge case. It's like as big as things get and as complicated as things get. And so there's things to be learned by, by taking an extreme case. And, and a lot of what, what the experience of, of running a MOOC would, would be still true, but on a more manageable scale for the kind of classes we do here. And, and James, stop me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I have not heard any institutional push for us to MOOCify things. <laughs> Quite the opposite. So, uh, sort of two comments, and they both involve the prefix meta. It seems that what you're doing, um, Bernie, kind of embedded within your approach, you're kind of almost promoting a little metacognition on their part. Whose part? Very, on the student's part. Yeah. But in a very, very low level kind of passive way. So if you thought about maybe, because you're trying to, you're asking them to sort of assess their own effort in their own learning. So are you trying to do it like that, trying to avoid promote it just to get a snapshot, or are you trying to sort of actively getting them to think about how well, they're approaching the course? Actually, built into all of my assignments is a reflection piece. So at the end of one of these projects, we ask them how it went, how they, you know, essentially the interpersonal stuff, the cognitive challenges that they faced. So that's, that's sort of built into it. Uh, I hadn't thought until you just said it that uh, about getting to be getting them to be more efficient in the way they use their time by by asking these questions. I, my 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 goal at this point is to make the the timesheet easy to fill out, and I'm not asking them to do the coding or anything. But I can look at that and figure out what's going on in the class. But but I think that's a nice sort of accidental secondary effect. Yep. And then for for what you covered, um, Amy. This sort of seems metamodal, right? It's sort of, <laughs> these are really best practices that you, that we would hope, we're doing in small classrooms. Um, but that's not necessarily always the case, I suspect, in every classroom. So, so I like how you sort of pushed it to, to scale how you maintain these things, but also remember why, why we're trying to do all this, right? Because it, there, is, there is a wealth of, of literature out there about these are basically effective best practices, so it's, it's nice to see them sort of framed in this mode. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we lose sight, too, of just the basics of being as organized as we can be, mm -hmm. <laughs> and just the aspect of communication, I think, uh, both of those combination, I think. We don't tend to spend a lot of time thinking about it, but they're key for any course, and I mm -hmm. think if we spend more time really understanding that more for each and every course we take, again, whether it's a small course or large course, I think we can be more effective. And the students, in turn, can, can also be more effective in their learning experience. So. Like we can take it for assumption in big classes, but I think we sometimes do take it as an assumption in small classes and these mm -hmm. kinds of things are maybe happening in a very informal way. Mm -hmm. So I I asked a question about how much time it takes developing. It takes a lot more time up front because you're right. thinking so deeply about it. Right. And I think when you know, I, okay. I affectionately call it the classroom okay. charisma that all teachers have, you can get in there and say, hey, we're doing this today. <laughs> <laughs> and you can pull things off that you may not have planned in advance. And when you go online, you have to plan every single piece of it. So that the hard thinking, that long time frame, it's, it's, I think if we spent that much time in our face-to-face -face classes, they would be exponentially better. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you, can't, you can't pull off charisma yeah. online as easily as you can standing in front of classrooms. Mm -hmm. And you can correct. And you can right. And you can say, you know, you can, it. you can still do it online, but you're better to anticipate it and plan around it. Mm -hmm. So that, it does take longer, but I think I, my experience is once you've got it in place and you've made your, you've run it once, and you've made your initial shifts, then you start to, to you know, realize the benefits of all your time. Mm -hmm. And it, it gets easy. Mm -hmm. well, it's that initial, I don't know, I, right. time, I can't put numbers right. on it. It takes a lot of time. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's worth it. <laughs> I'll take another second stab there. Uh, I, I thought it was really, I mean, the, one of the aha moments was this idea of bracketing the course with little messages like the entrance welcome to this week 
and the closure point, little midway thing. I think that's that's my aha take home for this because I think that would even if it was just a short little statement, mm -hmm. it could mean a lot to the students in any class. So that's one I'll take to my big classes as well as small. But this is a, I have another question that's kind of related to the other one, and that's your use of Facebook and the fact that this is outside of a regular, as I understand mm -hmm. it, a regular university setting. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues that we've, I've heard dealt with, in turn, I know students set up their own Facebook sites, mm -hmm. and I've heard two comments related to that. One is that if instructors try to set them up, they, aren't as effect, they don't seem to be as effective as if they're student generated. And the other is the issue about maintaining student privacy issues mm -hmm. on a Facebook site and how to deal with that. And mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if you could comment on one or both of those. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, for the Facebook uh, page, it's actually a page, um, but it's a closed page. Mm -hmm. So basically what happened is with the MOOC, uh, the students were invited to join it. It wasn't obligated. They didn't have to be. Uh, they didn't have. They weren't required to join it if they didn't want to, or if they didn't have a Facebook account. Um, but it would supplement the course. Mm -hmm. um, so we basically sent out the link. I created the page, mm -hmm. and then anyone who wanted to be added, I would see their name show up as the admin, check their name against the course, all the participants, to make sure that they are in the course, and then add them. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a way to keep the comments within the course community. So that's one way I think mm -hmm. we can manage aspects of it. But of course, again, with all of these tools, there's new concerns <laughs> and challenges with the ethics of using these platforms. So I think that's something we have to pay attention to and, and be aware of um, as well. So thank you. How can you handle evaluation? Evaluation, great question. So for this particular MOOC, what was set up was if the students had completed the weekly quizzes, and had an 80% or higher each week. If they had participated at least two to three times in the discussion forums each week, um, and then they also had to go through and review the reading materials and the video lectures for that week. And so at the end of the course, they received a certificate from the organization that was hosting this MOOC. And so analytics were run on the back end of all the reports of all 3,700 <laughs> students in the course to see who actually was applicable. And then they would apply for the certificate and then get the certificate based on the criteria if they met it or not. So the analytics did the part about looking to see if they read the assignments mm -hmm. online and if they... If they participated in the discussion forums, yeah. Did yep. they know that going in? Yes. The mm -hmm. They were given the certificate criteria from the first week. Great so that they knew right away ahead of time. If you want to get a certificate in the course, you can, and if you don't, you don't have to. They did pay a fee to the organization to get the certificate. It was about $30 um, for them to pay. And some of them, uh, last I had heard, over, f over 350 had requested a certificate, and they're still going in and requesting them now, I guess, since it's been a few months later. Is any attempt made to assess the quality of the participation, or is it just based on quantity? Assess the quality in terms of looking at the, the forum discussions and right. So you just put in blah 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 right. and get yeah. credit for it. I agree. Yes. Mm. Right. So the other aspect to this too is when running the data analytics, um, I also had a, a, a TA, a teaching assistant, who worked with me in looking at each of the forum posts to make sure that the comment was authentic, <laughs> that it wasn't I just agree, yes or no, um, in order for them to qualify. So that spent that was time on part of the TA to help with that aspect well, to identify who met the criteria or didn't. Or the same as another posters. I mean that's mm -hmm. another common problem too. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Copy and paste others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so you had a TA because with 3,700 students, <laughs> that's an awful lot of posts. Right. I mean even with you and a TA, no, no, you were reading 3,000 posts <laughs> a week. Not all of them. And like I said, you know, I would go through and read every 10th post um, each week or each, uh, every couple of days throughout the week because we had multiple forms. So I would go in and read through them and then make observations on every few and then copy and paste the ones that I thought were exemplars and put them in. And gave them the, um, and communicated with them ahead of time to tell them that I'm not going to be able to respond to each of you, but I will try my best to summarize and make observations of the general overall discussion and conversation here so that you can take that information away with you 
Um, and I seemed to be okay with that. No one had complained, but who knows if they may have said anything after that. But. I just want to make a quick comment for the folks who stuck around till the very end. Your <laughs> bonus is, and I don't know if you already mentioned this or not, but because of the questions having to do with assessment, I wanted to point out that we paid um, to tune into a webinar tomorrow morning from Adams Humanities 1112 that you're more than welcome to, to, to come drop in on at 10 a.m. about authentic assessment strategies for online learning. And the person who is going to be leading that webinar is a respected colleague of ours from the University of Central Florida who many see as really a, uh, a leader in the nation in terms of online education. So authentic assessment strategies for online learning tomorrow at 10 a.m. in Adams Humanities 11, 12, if you're interested in just dropping in on that. Or if you're at the iPad user group meeting, it happens right after that. So, <laughs> so there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to record it? Yeah. 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 So I, thank you. So I have a question about going back to assessment. Um, if we think in terms of student learning outcomes, mm -hmm. because I understand 3,700, you can skim through a post and interact and make, wrap them up and try and make, but how do we know? as instructors that the students are really meeting the outcomes that we set for a course in terms of knowledge, for mm -hmm. example? Well, a part of what I had done in the MOOC was that the student learning outcomes were tied to the questions that were posted in the discussion forums. But if we don't have the time to read the three, seven, <laughs> That's right, a, right to read through all of them. Like no, 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 that makes sense. I'm, I'm concerned. Right. With. Well, and I think the other, um, the other part to it too were the quizzes that they had as well. The quizzes allowed for them to solidify the concepts that they had. So the, the quiz questions weren't um, just uh, true or false or um, select the answer, uh, the multiple choice. They were, they were higher level questions in terms of the mm -hmm. quiz questions that really required them to have a critical mindset of how mm -hmm. they would respond. In many cases they were um, uh, scenarios that were proposed to them of how would you respond in this particular case, what tools would you use, that only they would be able to know the answer if they spent time during that week going through the reading, looking at right. the lecture, the video, right. and responding to the discussion forum. Right. So I tried to build out the student learning outcomes throughout the week with the right. different elements yeah. so that it would culminate into the quiz right. answer. Yeah but then also with the discussion forum post, mm -hmm. which is hard to do with that large and number. Did you sample to read, or how, how <laughs> really, honestly? You yeah, I mean, basically, like I said, yeah, answers to a question. basically what I would do is I would go through every night and look at the discussion forums and spend about three, three hours, three to four hours at night going through and looking at the posts and picking you know, every few and just reading through it, taking notes, and then go to the next one. Um, and just go through them. You did, you did that because because you were the course coordinator. Did the other faculty do any of that? They did that as well. Mm -hmm. because, yep. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, Amy, if you thought, for example, of using um, qualitative digital tools yeah. like Nudist or Envivo that mm -hmm. we use for a huge corpus of data and kind of go with, because I I would love to try this, but I'm scared of mm -hmm. thinking that I will not be reading. 3,700 entries mm -hmm. to be able to say yes, you met the, mm -hmm. the outcome or you didn't, but um, by using clusters and, mm -hmm. and thinking into then, then you may go quicker. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's a possibility. I didn't use that for this, but mm -hmm. that's something that could be considered mm -hmm. for other mm -hmm. courses. I think the one thing I'm afraid of with using some of those software um, approaches is that it could be taken out of the context in which it was posted. Mm. Um, so I'm not sure if I would feel that it captured everything mm -hmm. in that regard. But I think it's an idea that mm -hmm. could be possible. One thing I want to mention, and, and Linda and I were just having a sidebar over here, is how effective it can be to have peers review one another's mm -hmm. posting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Since in the Blackboard discussion mm -hmm. forum, mm -hmm. they can actually right. rate the quality mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. one another's posts, mm -hmm. um, which is a nice way of getting them exposed mm -hmm. to a broader right. perspective. Mm -hmm. And it, it can be quite effective, especially if you have something like a rubric that they mm -hmm. can use right. when yeah. they're evaluating one another's mm -hmm. posts. And it really helps them produce mm -hmm. a higher quality post right. themselves through that right. process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In a class, there were 80,000 students, and we each graded 
five other students plus ourselves and the average all of that work for all of that. When I saw that chart with, I thought it was an excellent chart with the interactions between the student and the instructor, between a student and him or herself, between a student and his or her peers and student with the material. What I saw in that, and the reason why I asked the question too, is not so much to put you on the spot, was just to, when I saw those areas, I was thinking, here's an opportunity for some sort of an assessment to occur. Because when I read the material, I periodically ask myself, and I yep. encourage my students to ask themselves, how well do I understand this before moving on to the next thing? And then when my students do their group work, in a sense, they're evaluating each other and the contributions that their peers are making. And so that's the, that's, that's sort of what I saw in that, yeah. and, and that's why I asked. No, you're, you're right. It, 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 assessment is not orthogonal to that. It, it, that's exactly, exactly right. I haven't been thinking about it that way, uh, more about the initial learning, but the assessment <laughs> could, could, could clearly happen uh, then as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very similar to calibrated peer review, for example. I mean, that's a, a way yeah. that you, uh -huh. you could incorporate, especially if you have a rubric already developed, because that's central to that CPR process. So that would be another way to do it. I mean, this is maybe just out of my curiosity. But so I assume you were teaching this course for another organization. I assume it was not all charity, but they paid these all these hours that you mentioned that you, you know, got put in. Um, and so you just tell me the students all together pay maybe ten thousand dollars or so for this course. I mean, you just send so many certificates, so many dollars. So, so what this organization? What what was it that I mean? Did they put ads online in that course, or you know what 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 was it that they came with that money on, on the table to <laughs> teach this course? Uh, this organization is um, they're based out of uh, UT Austin, and they're in the School of Journalism there. Um, in, in Austin and they've existed for over 10 years. They have a distance learning program that they've been running since 2003 that was primarily smaller courses that were about 20 to 30 people. Um, and uh, basically they, um, they've moved into this area of teaching MOOCs within the past year. Uh, and they focus par particularly in Latin America um, and so they've built their reputation over the past 10 years in teaching a uh, variety of dif different topics on journalism to journalists in Latin America, primarily. Um, but within the past year, they've moved into this realm about MOOCs, um, in particular, and offering this journalism skill sets out to as many people as possible. So they received n uh, funding from the Knight Foundation over those 10 years <laughs> to operate um, out of UT in Austin. In um, some cases, sorry to interrupt Amy, but it's a lost leader. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. it's a way for people to it's a way for them to raise awareness about their degree and certificate programs within the University of Texas at Austin's particular school of journalism in yeah. this case. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there, there's a certain cachet now among the big research universities mm -hmm. like UT, like your, you know, the, the schools that you think of, you know, the Penn States and so on, mm -hmm. that they want to be in the game, you know, for whatever reason, and it may be ego-based of the mm -hmm. senior admin people, who knows what the drivers are, mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's happening. Mm -hmm. Not like, I, I just want to go back to your question earlier, because at least with the current provost, we'll see what happens in the future, <laughs> but I know as long as Nancy is the chief academic officer, there will be no MOOCs offered at the state. <laughs> I was really um, glad to hear you say that. I was just reading a, one of those publications that you get from CFA, and, and they're talking about San Jose State, mm -hmm. where they did some uh, MOOC type courses. And, and dropped it. And mm -hmm. all the problems they had yeah. with it, and, and how they can't get any of the evaluation data from anybody. Mm -hmm. And they were trying to, they were comparing these courses given in the spring and the summer, and what they did find was that, you know, they say how many people completed and how many were successful, but in the, and the summer was better. And so you would think, you know, you got better doing it, but the summer, the students were already people who had degrees from some university already, and the spring students were just undergraduate students, so, mm -hmm. you know, it was not co comparable groups, and it, it was a little bit scary that they were kind of pushed into this. But on the other hand, the whole, I mean, that's what I got from Amy Collier's talk, was that a lot of the philosophy behind MOOCs is that we want everyone to learn mm -hmm. and so, yeah not everybody might finish it but 
are, are we willing mm -hmm. to offer these things so people will learn something? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I want people to be more scientifically literate, everyone. Mm -hmm. And so if I can engage them and hold on to them for as long as they can stick with it, they may pick it up at another time. They may not finish my MOOC but, or course, but if they, if they can read the literature a little bit better at the end, or if they are engaged enough to try it again mm -hmm. at another time, then that's part about learning for all. And that people are learning. That's the issue. People are learning all the time, every minute, more than ever with the information that we have. Do we want them to learn the right things? <laughs> or, or do we have, want to have some control over that? And I think that's one reason to, to support MOOCs for those purposes, for learning for all. Learning for a degree may be a very different process. And I, I think everybody will agree that there's added value. There better be added value for our students paying gas money and babysitter costs and parental care costs to come to our classrooms and engage in activities here. There better be an added value to that, or it's wasted money on everybody's part. We're all losing. So I think we, that's it, what's different. Even if we do courses online, I mean, I think there's a huge difference between offering a course for you know 60 students online than offering a MOOC. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And there's added value to that yeah. over a MOOC, sure, mm -hmm. and certainly. And we just have to keep in mind what those are and promote those those value that added value. Yeah. I think that you know there are certainly some very noble motives behind MOOCs, and you know people talk about how it's democratizing education and you know opening up to these people who are abroad and who would never have an opportunity otherwise. And I think there's definitely something to that, and I I, I think it's exciting for us in terms of just exploring what's possible right. in terms of the data that they're getting, like the edX research that Bernie sh shared with us. That you know there's this sweet spot at six minutes. Well, the end that they were looking at to, to draw that conclusion <laughs> Millions. was enormous. Yeah. And for us to gather that kind of data that we could actually act upon, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it's really a struggle. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm excited about it. I think it's a really interesting time for us all. I, I read one business case for MOOCs as well. It was, it was among community college educators. They, they identified courses that people weren't courses that were prerequisites to a whole bunch of other classes and they offered it through a MOOC and they figured that if they offered the MOOC at whatever it cost and only 10 percent of the people passed it that was 30 classrooms that they wouldn't have to to, wow. to pay instructors mm -hmm. for and, and, and so on wow. so it, it even though 90 percent never finished it was still worth their while in terms of speed to completion. You might want to say pay power for and feel silly. The pay instructors part is probably going to well, be yeah. helpful. <laughs> 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 That's what makes the hair stand up on the back of the neck. But you're right. You're right. Yeah. But it also then pays faculty to do other things that may be more exciting for them mm -hmm. or more engaging for them. Mm -hmm. So it relieves the faculty of doing those things. If students really do learn in, those, in that format and can then go on to higher level courses, that may be the better place to put the salary funds. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but that's not what the administrators want. They no. just want <laughs> lower cost, less faculty. I don't know. <laughs> I'm a cynic. I'm a I don't cynic. know. Someday there'll be only that's one capital, biology I mean, teacher. It won't we be you. In capitalism, that's what the argument would be. That's 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 what capitalism is all about. So. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. This is great. And, uh, and the, the information will be available, I hope, soon, so that you can point your friends to it. Thank you.